Good evening, folks. It's the end of October, and it's certainly starting to feel like it. Tonight on Discovering, we do some late season goose hunting in the Garden Peninsula. The layout blind, that's the biggest thing to overcome, I'd say, in goose hunting. And we take a look at milling lumber with a portable sawmill. So sit back and relax. It's Monday night, and it's time for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land, there is so much to discover. When you're a long-time lover of northern Michigan If you need lumber for a project, there are options. You can buy some from your local lumber yard, cut your own trees and haul them to a sawmill, or have the sawmill come to you. Need cutting done in the UP. There are a lot of guys that have mills in their backyards <laughs> that are out looking to pick up some extra money. There's been a bit of a resurgence in DIY, learning to be self-sustainable, something that youpers know all about. I'm living in a log cabin and we need to replace a couple logs. Uh, if I didn't have this mill, I don't know how I would have cut a log straight on three sides with a curve on the other. Like knowing where your food comes from, knowing where the wood that built your home or cabinets came from is something that people are valuing. And building and creating pieces from trees on your own property adds to the character and story. Todd Poyer bought a portable sawmill and turned it into a practical hobby. You know, I wanted to reside my house and I decided I wanted to do it myself, so I picked up the chainsaw mill. Milled a lot of wood, but never did get my house done. Picked up this because it cut a lot faster and ended up cutting for a lot of other people. I met Todd at a home he was milling at. Sarah, the homeowner, had a few pine trees cut down that were leaning toward the house she recently purchased. So today you're taking this lumber, right? I am taking this lumber. Um, Sarah, who had some trees cut down on her property, didn't want to cut them all up firewood, knew there was some good lumber here, and put an ad on Facebook, and I got lucky enough to be the first one to respond. I'm going to be making a carport and probably cupboards and counters and shelves, and but mostly a carport. This is a Woodland Mills bandsaw mill. It's an HM130 Max, which is the biggest saw mill they make. It can cut a 38 inch tree. You can cut a little bigger than that, but you've got to get creative with a chainsaw to cut away some slabs. It's got two flywheels inside to turn the blade. And I'll open it up and show you. It's easier to explain. How mm -hmm. about that? The two wheels spin the blade. It's a large bandsaw, uh, inch and a quarter, I think, wide. The blade I have on here right now is a medium duty blade. It's great for pine, some softer hardwoods. This is a tank with uh, lube in it. Uh, I'm using a mix of water and windshield washer fluid that keeps the gum and the pine from sticking on the blade and gumming everything up. Uh, if you're cutting in the winter, if you're cutting wood that's kind of dry, you don't need any lube. In the summer or with pine that's fresh, you definitely want to run something through there to keep the pitch from sticking to the blade. We've got log scales. Tells me how high up and down I'm moving the head. And it's just got a handle. I move the head up and down. You look at the numbers, you cut how deep you want. I bring it down to the top of the wood. The last cut I made was about 16 inches. So my next, actually I'm gonna roll the log before we make another cut, but I would cut one or two inch sec, um, thicknesses. So I would just drop this down to where it's showing 14 inches up on the scale. Start the thing up, 
push the throttle forward, that starts the blade moving and you push it through the log. As long as you've got a blade that's sharp, you don't have any problems. A lot of the higher end, more professional mills have hydraulics that lift the log on the mill for you, raise and lower the head. I wasn't looking for anything that fancy. I just wanted something that would get the job done and this mill has done a great job of doing that. The way the portable sawmill is designed, the head with the engine and blade moves back and forth while the log remains stationary. The operator pushes the head down the log, different from traditional mills where the log moves on a trolley while the blade remains fixed in one spot, like we saw at the old Alberta sawmill earlier this year. Todd measured, turned the log, cut, turned the log, cut, turned, and cut the log into various sizes. I imagine it takes time to learn how to cut the log to get a maximum yield and the board sizes you need. This was the other segment of this tree we cut up tonight. And we've got uh, four by eights. So we've got an eight by eight. Uh, that's a four by 12, I think. Part of it's intuitive just from doing it often enough. Part of it, there's different ways of cutting wood, different kind of grain you end up with. Part of it is cutting for specific grain patterns. Not a lot of guys I know that I've cut for really worried about the grain pattern much. Most of the people just wanted one inch slabs, which was easy. You take and cut your four sides of the log square, and then you just keep cutting one inch sec segments out of it, and you've got one inch board, so however wide the log is. They call that squared off log a cant. We cut this first 24 inch tree into these pieces in hour, hour and a half. And that was getting it on the mill too. The cutting itself didn't take all that long. But it depends what you want too. I mean, if we were cutting all these down to two by fours or one inch, one by eight inch boards, it'd take a lot longer because there's a lot more cuts involved. So it really depends what you want. Pines are softer wood that cut easier. Uh, hardwoods, maple and oak take a little bit different blade to cut them eff efficiently, a little more aggressive blade. Um, and you cut them a little slower just because the wood is so hard you can't push as fast as you can through pine. Todd let us all be Sawyers for a few minutes. He told me to let the blade do the cutting, which I felt I was doing, but at the same time, you definitely need to push. I think it would take some time to get used to the speed at which you need to cut. Freshly sawn lumber is called green wood and contains a lot of moisture. So the next step would be drying it out before using it. The drying process involves putting what they call stickers between each piece, each board um, and letting the air run through it. And I'll probably paint the ends to keep the wood from cracking. Um, if you don't paint the ends, you'll get splits in the log, sometimes a foot long. So you end up losing all that. Um, you cover it up, don't let it rain down, get it, don't let it get rained on, don't let the sun hit it directly. And some of these bigger boards would take a year to dry. Some of the one inch stuff down near the bottom of the stack would dry over the course of a couple of months. The actual sawing of the log looks like a one man operation, but getting the logs onto the sawmill takes a couple more sets of hands and some good muscle power if you don't have any equipment to pick up the logs. So in addition to a hobby, it's a good workout. I'm not really looking for jobs right now. <laughs> I have enough projects of my own where I'm looking to cut my own lumber. The first summer I had this and I was doing cutting, I had guys coming to me. They heard I had a sawmill. They had some trees at camp they wanted to cut down. They wanted to put a camp up. They wanted to make an addition. Um, surprising how many guys out there that own property or women out there that own property know the value of a tree and the lumber that's in it. And, they want to do something with their wood rather than burn it. If you've gone to the big box stores lately and you see what their wood looks like and how twisted it is and how expensive it is, all you have to do is look at the wood you get off a mill like this and add up what you're spending on it. It makes a lot of sense to have a cut like this. I love the process of taking a log like that and turning it into 
especially after getting in a, in a planer and getting it smoothed down, being able to make something with lumber I've made myself is a great feeling. This three-man <laughs> army! Oh my god! Look at it. Oh. Oh. oh, dude, nothing feels better. Nothing feels better than that. Oh, oh my gosh. Look at they still want to come. Oh my gosh. It don't get better. So I don't know what you're going to call it. Like, you know, the three man army or last chance honkers. I don't even know. There's a lot of titles that I was thinking of. This is Jordan Harper, and this is Tristan Mishker. And we just shot a limit of geese. And by we, I mean we. The third man in that army is me. So what'd you think? That's a lot of fun. <laughs> I know, it's fun when it works out. We're in the Garden Peninsula. The windmills give that away. And this is my first goose hunt. My original plan was just to film because that's what I do. But Jordan wanted me to hunt too. So I thought I'd give it the old college try and see if I could set up a few cameras on tripods to catch the action. I was having too much fun shooting geese and forgot I was also working. Each camera battery died at some point and the cameras weren't pointed in the best directions. But you know what? We had a blast anyways. So we know that I'm Tristan Mishker. I run Uper Gold Sport Fishing and Guide Services out of garden here. Um, we do quite a bit of goose hunting, uh, some diver hunting, and a lot of ice fishing out on Little Bay. What do you enjoy about being out here? Oh, everything about it. Just being outdoors and, you know, chasing the birds and watching how they react and learning new ways to decoy them and call them and just learning the birds, really. It's mid-October, late in the season, and these Canada geese are migrating through, heading to the central and southern U.S. and parts of northern Mexico. It's one of the first signs that winter is coming when you hear honking from above and you look up to see the southbound flying V. We hunt them pretty hard when they're moving, you know. Early season we slow down a little bit because they, depending on the weather, it depends on how many birds are coming through, you know. So, so you say, is this late season then? Yeah, well, mid-season, but I'd say it's about the perfect time for them to be migrating down. Everything's moving right now, the divers and... We've had some pretty good north winds, so, you know, it's getting good, huh? Just a week ago, Jordan said the fields were filled with hundreds of geese. A few days later, most geese took off on a strong north wind. You know, we scrambled, me and Tristan, we like got a hold of each other and we're like, hey, you go this way, I'll go the other way, and we'll go find the dang geese. <laughs> so, yeah, and, you know, this is pretty much the only field that we found from scouting that was really worth it. After scouting, Jordan assured me there were still plenty of geese left to drive down for a hunt, so I purchased my Michigan waterfowl license and federal migratory bird hunting stamp and headed to garden for a morning of goose hunting. The guys were up early and had the layout blind and decoys ready when I arrived. These are the layouts and, you know, this, this kind of setup where there's not a, like a hedgerow or like something to set up you're sitting in the middle of the field is these these are a lot lower to the ground so they're easier to hide and stuff we're set up in the middle of a cut corn field and this is where the geese want to come in the morning to feed when they're off the roost but man look at these jokers <laughs> staying out in the field and they want it but yeah so in the morning they, they come off their roost to come and feed and there's a pond over here that a few are roosted on, but most of them are roosted on the big lake. Um, and then they go break, take their break after they get their fill and they'll come back in the evening. So they'll, they'll probably be all these ones we're seeing right now are gonna come back tonight. The wind is coming from the south, so we're facing north with a spread of decoys in front of us with plenty of room for geese to land. Yeah, birds always want to land into the wind. Goose, ducks, anything wants to land into the wind. So you want to have the wind hitting your back as much as you can or, you know, doing, you know, a cross shot with it coming from the side somehow. So you set your decoys up accordingly. The next thing I learned is the hide is most important. Yeah, so the main thing with goose hunting besides being where they want to be is actually the hide. Like you can put yeah. out as much decoys as you want and 
if they if they know there's something in there that in the field you know it don't yeah. take much either for them not to like you know it could just be like as simple as like some of your like shiny camel on your blind yeah or like that blind on the end actually like these blinds they've, they've been mudded in before so they're darker that blind on the end is brand new yeah so. when he says mudded in he means like he takes a bucket bucket and, of mud and smear it all over yeah because yeah. that camel's got a little bit of shiny so mm -hmm. anything like that could flare them but they work today even with the camera sitting behind us. Yeah, you want to overbrush in so you're just not worried about it the whole right. time too. Like the whole, most of the time I'm still like. You can never it. hide too much. Yeah. <laughs> It was cool to watch the flock drop altitude and circle us before they finally glided down in front of us into the decoys. I was worried they'd spot one of the cameras and we would be busted. At first it seemed like they were wary of our setup, but after moving some decoys around and hiding the back camera a bit better, everything happened like it should. Each time the geese flew in, low and hot, Tristan yelled out, and it was an explosion of shotguns, geese flaring, and dropping out of the sky. Oh, baby! <laughs> shoot him behind you, Rick. You got him. <laughs> no, shoot, guys. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Even the ducks wanted in on the action. Ice cream. Don't get much better than that. Triple curl? Triple curl. Ooh. Oh, that goose. Oh. Yep, yep. Most of my geese flew or landed to the right. Unfortunately, none of the cameras were pointed over there. If I would have realized that, and that was going to be the pattern all morning, I might have thought to move one. <laughs> it was constant action. Flocks of geese kept coming, and they wanted this field badly. Kill those. Nice. We did some shooting there, Dang, guys. I didn't, even, I didn't even see those ones over there. <laughs> The reason that we get them though is we put in the time for the, yeah. for the scout and like we I mean we drove so much yeah we spent geese. yeah all day yesterday pretty much yeah it came trying together. to lock a field down and there was a couple other fields that we had that we were questioning but this was the one it worked out even more exciting than the bonus ducks Tristan shot a banded goose what you got a band yeah no way. Getting a banded bird is a rare thing and is the waterfowl hunter's equivalent to a trophy buck. This leg jewelry is more than a trophy though. Hunters play a role in conservation and research when they report the band. About 100,000 geese are banded annually in North America. When a bird is banded, the number along with the bird's age, sex, species, and location is sent to the Bird Banding Laboratory, a division of the United States Geological Survey. On the shiny band is a number and the website reportband.gov. Fill out the report and you're instantly told approximately how old that bird is and when and where it was banded. Female Canada goose. Really? Yes, man. Yes, sir. Pewanik, Ontario, Canada. Date banded 7-25-18. And Jordan gave me an easy recipe to try. Apples, onions, and cranberry sauce. You put the the onions in first, then the apples, and then the cranberry sauce, and like you take uh, two inch cubes. It's not bad, you got a doctor of geese to take good, so. I did as instructed and chopped everything up. Heated a drizzle of olive oil in a cast iron pan, sauteed the onions and apples for a few minutes, I read to cook goose to 165, but did overcook it a bit. I haven't run into many people who like goose, so was nervous to try it. 
It was actually really good and I'd make it again. It was just sweet enough and tasted pretty similar to any other red meat. So Jordan, the recipe. That's all for tonight, and I hope to see you right back here next week for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.